Now in a new four-part series, Gareth Fitzgerald talks to a different host each week about his life and career. Tonight he's with John Bowman discussing his childhood and early years. And this programme was recorded just before the death of Charles J. Ahi. <laughs> Gareth Fitzgerald, are you aware of the moment when you first had a, an ambition to be a politician? Well, I suppose it was potentially in my mind, but it was really, I suppose, when I was 15 and Father Burke Savage ran the Debating Society in uh, Belvedere, I said that it's a career I should look to at some point in the future. Um, my recollection is he suggests I aim to be a teacher, but he had no memory of that in later life. Perhaps I invented that part. And were you an ambitious schoolboy? Uh, e well, e yes. But I, I, I was tended to be distracted from what I should be doing by all kinds of other interests. Uh, my parents worried about that, that I would uh, pick up so much useless information I might never get anywhere. But in fact, the useless information often turns in handy. You were the, the last child that, that your parents had. Your mother was hoping for a girl, is that right? She was and was desperately disappointed when I wasn't a girl. Went out for several months to the continent. Anchor health was also affected by the birth and uh, went to Switzerland and to Monte Carlo to the casino there. She liked gambling, rather uncharacteristically in every other respect. She seemed very rather straight-laced. Uh, and uh, I was looked after for the first couple of months by an aunt and cousins in Bangor County Down. What, your mother, a gambler, she, as a Presbyterian, that, that was a, a contradiction, was it not? Well, yes, but she was also, of course, a, a suffragette socialist Republican, which again, for a Presbyterian daughter of a Belfast Unionist businessman, was a bit against the, against the tide. Yeah. And how aware were you of that mixed background, your mother, an Ulster Presbyterian? Well, I was aware of it because, you see, uh, as children, our contacts were with our cousins who were either northern Protestants, Presbyterian Church of Ireland, or London Irish Catholics. They were our cousins. They came and stayed with us every summer, Christmas, Easter, different times. So uh, I was very conscious of that. And I had the experience then when I was quite small of saying something pejorative about Protestants. My mother said, looking down from the floor, you, we do know I'm a Protestant too, dear, don't you? And uh, that, that was a lesson for me. Now, when you were growing up, <coughs> your father was a government minister. How aware were you? Of that? Well, not very, because he ceased to be minister when I was six. So uh, I have, must have had some awareness of it, but it was more when he ceased to be minister. And I saw more of him, because he was at home much more. Then I became conscious of a change, yes, in that respect. And was uh, it pain? It was painful for him, wasn't it? He, he, was, okay. he remained bitter about the Civil War and about the Treaty Divide, didn't he? Yes, he never forgave de Valera. Um, I mean, uh, he, he wasn't bitter about others. <coughs> in fact, for him, for great friends, the McIntyre family were great friends of ours, and they were often at our house. So politics didn't necessarily divide families from each other. Uh, but he didn't forgive de Valera what he saw as his having been persuaded for personal reasons, he thought, to go against the treaty, having told Griffith to get him out, off the stra out of the straight jacket of the Republic. So there was always a problem there. And how did that manifest itself? Well, when de Valera's name came up, it was, it was not well received, put it that way. Both your parents were in out in 1916 yes. and very involved, and yet they took different sides in the, on the Civil War themselves. Yes, my mother, like most women, except some wives of ministers, um, was Republican uh, and remained so for quite a few years afterwards, to the late 20s, I think till after Kevin Higgins' murder, which I think may have affected her. She was also, as a Presbyterian, very impressed by the integrity of the first government, and that brought her around. So by the time I had any consciousness of politics at all, there was no division between them. But there was a difference. My mother wrote to my father, in, he was in America in 1935, saying he was in danger of allowing his anti-communism to make him insufficiently tough about the Nazis and fascists. So she was more to the left, and he was a very conservative Catholic. Though after Kristallnacht, I was very clear what side we were on. Were you aware in 1932 that your father had lost power, had lost the election? I have no memory of that, but I do 
remember that I saw much more of him from then on. Indeed, that June we went and holidayed together, my next brother and my parents in Car Daniel. We've never done that before. And uh, uh, so that life improved in that respect. And that was my next brother, Fergus, and all his romantic ideas and so on. Uh, and the fact that our house was full of people at the weekends you'd have, especially in summer, but also winter, uh, parties. Then my elder brother's friends from college would come out. There was no alcohol of any kind. It was all on lemon juice, pure lemon and tea. And nobody seemed to complain. It was, uh, and then our cousins coming in from London, Belfast. So it was a wonderful time. I had a very happy and full childhood. Privileged, uh, some would say, idyllic pri even? Oh, privileged and idyllic, yes. Because, in fact, I suppose the period my parents were best off, the latter part of the period in government, and the money lasted for a few years afterwards before we had to leave this lovely house and grounds, and then we became less well off as time went on. So my childhood coincided with the best part uh, of the family's life in economic terms. And my elder brothers, their experience had been dragged around to prisons in Britain or Ireland uh, to see their father. It was a somewhat different background. And what about um, your social life growing up? What are your memories of, of that? Well, um, we lived in Bray in a house south of Bray, uh, and there weren't many other children around, but there was a school there. But the school was one where my mother apparently asked them to keep me on after First Communion when the other boys left, which was then the tradition in some of these schools. And I was then for four years in a school with girls only, and that had a very considerable effect on me. In what way? Well, two ways. First of all, I read, they tended to gang up on me to some degree, but individually. I got on well with them, so I said, you, you pick one girl and you might and that was that, when I was eight. And at the same age, um, the King of Yugoslavia and the French Foreign Minister were assassinated in Marseille, and at 11 o'clock at the change of classes in mid-morning, the teacher mentioned this, and some of the girls seemed to know about it, and I, I failed to hide the fact that I didn't. So I was so humiliated as a male that I said I'd read the paper from then on to keep in touch with international affairs. So my interest in international affairs and my decision to get married early both uh, came at age eight. And did this young woman know that you had this intention towards her? I don't know. Um, we did later on when we were in college, but then in second year in college, she, her interest was elsewhere, and I had to review my position. I proposed to Joan several months later. Growing up, um, in terms of hobbies, um, you, you, you say, that, were you really alone then? You, you, oh, no. Your, brother, your <coughs> next brother was six years older, yes, wasn't he? Yes, and he was a very powerful influence. He was very romantic. So we had to study the hieroglyphics and write hieroglyphic in hieroglyphics to each other. Uh, he went into the National Library, he was 13, copied out the grammar and syntax and much of the vocabulary of the Quechua language of the Incas of Peru. And I had to learn to type um, with two fingers and a thumb, and I never got, not, never got any better at it since. He'd recruited English you as his manservant, had he? Yeah, well, to, to, to type out a fair copy of what he had written down in a red notebook. Uh, we had the Aztecs as well, all kinds of things like that. He, uh, he and I joined the uh, New Astronomy Society in Dublin. I was about eight or nine. I was also registered for Anoiga. I don't remember if I were going any, any hikes at that stage. I was too young. So his interest became my interest, and he was very influential um, in the games we played and in the interests we had. What sort of games? Oh, well, the, the paths in the garden were used to simulate the French railway system. We had King Arthur, the knights, we, with bows and arrows, and Cows, I found, were great targets, because you can't miss them, and the arrow doesn't hurt them, and they don't go very fast. So both and arrows firing at the cows in the fields was also another pastime. What about team games, then? Well, no, there, Sports, weren't, there weren't any yeah. team games then, obviously, at that stage of my life. When I went to Bivadir, I was asked to go and play football, and I went out to play in Grand's Palmerston Club, which is near Middletown Park. But my vague recollection is that they seemed to expect me to run after the wall, seems to me at age 10, it's a bit old, we're running after things. So I opted out immediately. And never very really keen to run anyway. Uh, so, and I once, uh, I used to score for the cricket team, and once they were so short they put me in, and I hit a ball, to some, the obvious astonishment of everybody, so nobody caught it. And I made one run not out, that's my entire sporting career. And I have to say in Bevedere, we weren't pushed into being, we were pushed into praying for the, our team to win, which I, to which I had theological objections, but not did into play. Did you express them? Oh, yes, I did. I pointed out to the priest that either the prayers worked or were unfair or didn't or were pointless. I didn't get anywhere with the Jesuits in that. We're fighting black, playing Black Rock, I can tell you. So little, just no response? It, yeah, well, I found when I expressed theological views, they didn't go down very well with the Jesuits. 
And were you interested in religion then at that point? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any interest in becoming a priest? Never. And the Jesuits were so wise, they never thought of asking me to do so or suggesting it. They knew that I was destined for marriage, I think. At Belvedere, you were two years younger than your class, is that yes. right? Yeah. Was that a mistake? Was no, no. A hot, was that not a hothouse atmosphere? No, on the contrary. It meant that I had to work hard to survive. And uh, I never went first in class. I'd get like, fourth or sixth or something like that. That was very good for me, I think. It kept me on my toes. The trouble was, of course, when I finished, I was too young to go to UCD. That was a problem. My mother entered me for Trinity, but uh, it was a problem. My father was a very conservative and orthodox Catholic. So he would not let me go to Trinity without the permission of the Archbishop. He also d had trouble with the Archbishop because the Archbishop had closed down a society, the Mercier Society, in 1942, to bring Catholics and Protestants together. And he was too annoyed with the Archbishop to ask him. So I was sent back to school for a year, um, which was a nuisance at the time. But I, I meant I did philosophy in Belvedere, which was uh, a useful addition to my interests. What about choice then of career uh, in terms of going to university? What did you decide to study? Well, really you have to go back a bit because the choice of career came first. And the university was in a sense irrelevant to it. When I was 12, I definitely decided I wanted to be an Aer Lingus and to help run the airline. Of course, the airline then had 12 people, a box of tools and a biscuit tin, and one canvas plane, I think. Uh, uh, so uh, it was a bit premature. But by the time, of course, I did leave, left the university, it was a substantial airline, and I was able to fulfill my ambition. Um, secondly, at 15, then the idea of politics. So they were the two careers I fixed on. But as regards uh, the university, well, I was not a science person. So it was languages, and so I, I chose in... Uh, I, I went did nine subjects in first year, I think, examined in eight. And... Um, in second year, then I decided I would do three subjects rather than two and have, I thought, a better choice of possibilities of getting a good degree. And I did French, Spanish, and uh, history. History was my main interest and had been since the later stages of school. And at UCD then, uh, Charles Hohey was there at the time, yes. your contemporary of his. Yes. Uh, did you know him? Oh, we knew each other, certainly, but he was. Uh, we, we had different interests. I was LNH and Law Society. He did speak occasionally at the LNH, he was more Commerce Society. SRC, Student Representative Council. He was always with boys in first year, who, all of whom were the sons of Fianna Fáil ministers. I was always with girls. And of course, at that time, we were very divided on the war. I had been deeply pro-Allied and anti-Germans were at school and going there. Whereas he, many of the students would have been so, so anti-British, they'd be pro-German. So we were divided politically also. Without knowing a lot about the war, they said Britain's enemy is my friend. Oh, yes, it's only 20 years after the War of Independence, and, and in Belvedere, too, many of the students were anti-British, pro-German. Many of the teachers were. French teacher wasn't. The other late teachers were, and some of the clerics were. Uh, and I fought that battle. I mean, I, I copied out the part of it, Brenda Sorge, Pope Pius XI's encyclical about the Nazis, and used, I have still have the notes, and used it in the schoolyard to propagandize against the Germans. But I always felt I was a minority. And did you take an interest in the course of the war? Oh, yes, enormous interest. Mm. You know, I have a box somewhere to have 150 maps I drew of the war at the time. My parents were so concerned, and mentioned the war was such, they thought I wouldn't get a good degree. In fact, in March of 45, they sold the radio to stop me listening to it. But I just went to friends' houses and listened to it there. And how informed could you be at that time? Because after all, those oh, censorship. Very well, informed. Yeah? well, the censorship, but not on the facts. You got the communicators on both sides. You used to know what was happening. And uh, also, we got the Daily Mail for some reason, as well as Irish Independent. I think at the time, perhaps Irish Times, I'm not sure, and the Catholic Herald. So we did have a lot of input on the British side as well as the probably were getting through the censorship here. And of course, listen to the BBC all the time, every night at nine o'clock. Your student days, Garrett, at UCD, the 1940s, this was a very sheltered Ireland. Ireland was neutral, the war yes. was going on, and a very conservative society. Were you aware of how sheltered it all was? Well, yes. I was outward looking, but society was very inward looking. And what was UCD like? I was uh, very relaxed, great fun, um, not too much pressure. I, mean, I did all these subjects, but I didn't actually work very hard. <coughs> I had a wonderful time. Uh, after at least um, seven years in the all male school to meet all these girls, it was wonderful. I really got a lot out of it uh, every way. And then, of course, meeting Joan, wrote into her in the second year. and. She accepted me some months later. So that side of my life was on course. 
And mm -hmm. your father, uh, your parents perhaps thought that you were getting married too young, did they? My father was uh, very opposed. Uh, he had worries. My previous brother, my next brother, was in the army and was married, and they, they all joined the army in May 1940 from college, once the Germans invaded France, and uh, not finishing their degrees, and he worried about that. So uh, he didn't like the idea of getting married young, there was a difficulty. Father Buck Savage came and talked to him, but he didn't like a young Jesuit telling him what he was to do about his son. Happily, it all worked out, because then, when I got an interest and got a job, um, he was opposed to that, thought I only did it to get married, not realizing I was passionately interested in air transport. And for two months, he didn't speak to me. And then he sort of realized that I was genuinely interested, was more interested than just marriage, and did speak to me. He died a month later, so we had a good month before he died. And how close had you been to him? Well, very close. Uh, very close indeed, and very influenced by his views, uh, politically, historically, theologically, uh, and sharing his conservatism then and for another 10 years or so afterwards. When, only when I went to start teaching UCD later on that my views began to move to the left. So how conservative were you? You were anti-communist at that point, yes, weren't you? I was. Yes, I yes. was. The, as Ireland was, really. Yes, I got in some trouble. I wrote an article on that subject which um, brought three libel actions. So I learned a lesson from that as a journalist later on, part of my life. Um, uh, it was only in the late, in the late 50s, coming to teach in college, and uh, with my own children growing up, and with um, the students challenging my views, that I realized the conservatives of my youth did not stand up to scrutiny. But you were 12 when you wanted to join Aer Lingus. Yes. You had that sort of ambition. Yes. Now, <coughs> it was only two years old at the time, but it was still a pioneering uh, aviation story when you joined, wasn't it? I mean, it was still a very young company. It was, yes. They had just uh, moved to all-metal aircraft. There was still a seamstress on the staff whose job had been to sew up the planes that they got torn, the canvas. <laughs> and one of my first jobs was to allocate um, uh, leave allowances to people. I gave her 18 days, and I and my friends who joined at the same time 18 days, and other people more or less accordingly. It was the first responsibility I ever had. But then I was sent to the sales department. I'd no, I'd been no use to selling anything. You know, what on earth to do? My interest was in making an efficient airline. So I began to produce timetables, estimates of traffic, and the company got mad. They'd opened routes to places where there's no traffic at all. I remember going to my boss in November of 47 and saying slightly, sarcastically, in view of the fact that no paying passenger had traveled between Shannon and Paris in any of the last three weeks, the flight going twice a week, would they consider reviewing the flight? There were staff were traveling for nothing but no paying passengers, so that was cancelled. You've been described at this moment when you're still a young man as rather juvenile in manner, yes. full up with yourself. Yes and a good deal of a prig. Now, that yeah. description is by yourself in your autobiography. Yes, that's right, yeah. So, but, but I think the fact that I was so interested and that I had ideas of estimates of traffic which turned out to be right, ideas for scheduling the aircraft, so they let me do this from this position. Then they brought me into head office after a couple of years, but said, don't tell anybody what you're doing. You won't give any title. It'll upset the people who are supposed to be doing the work. The following year, I was put in charge of timetables. The following year, I got rates and fares, advice on uh, routes to be planned. Um, uh, in fact, I had uh, uh, NIST of route planning, and then some advice on choice of aircraft and that. So by the age of 25, I had really, um, was the, in a key position for all these areas of the economic aspect. The Strategic airline. planning, really. Yeah, which was very exciting. You know, it's sometimes been said of you, it's a sort of a joke about Gareth Fitzgerald, oh, that works in practice, but Gareth will ask, but does it work in theory? Never. No. Never theory. Is that unfair? Totally. It's the opposite of truth. Because I knew no theory. <laughs> I had to invent a theory as a basis for decisions, but I was not a theoretician at all. I was just the practical thing. Getting the turnaround time down to 20 minutes. I did that 50 years for, uh, before I inherited it. <laughs> With smaller aircraft, of course. And throughout this time, you were beginning to work as a freelance journalist as well. Yes, I wrote a few articles in 20 or 21, but when I was 22, I was stuck in bed with chickenpox at the time of the 1948 election. My mother gave me the Writers and Artists Yearbook with the names of newspapers. So I wrote articles and sent them out to various parts of the Commonwealth. And two of them were published in South Africa and India. So I had some money in this. So by the time I was 23, I had a chain of 14 papers. I was the Irish correspondent, 10 in the Commonwealth and 4 in provincial Britain. Uh, and I began writing for The Independent. I had a, a weekly column on foreign affairs. Which I used to be fair lingus, go down to the National Library, down to the Encyclopedia Britannica, last edition. Keating's contemporary archives, which update, and perhaps I end up not written into them. And uh, 
I did other articles from too and things like tourism and that. But eventually they dropped the column, I think, in my articles that I wrote that said tourism was too dull and the one on the decline in the teaching of Irish in the universities was too controversial. So I went to the Irish Times in December 54 and they took me on. And it was Jack White, the features editor, who said, if you can do something on tourism, you can do something on uh, government finances and so on. And he pushed me around. Well, what about the thing called, the thing called national accounts? What are they? I had no idea what they were. But I found out. And uh, so I became an economics correspondent. And how did you then join the UCD staff? Well, that's complicated. In 1958, I decided at the time, it's time to move on. The EU had been established. The Treaty of Rome signed in March 57. We would eventually be joining. It seemed to me that in the early decades at least, Irish agriculture could benefit hugely from joining because Britain could no longer exploit us with a cheap food policy, prices would go up. But that the obstacle was going to be Irish industry, which was incredibly inefficient. And if we couldn't join because industry couldn't cope, that would be a terrible blow to us. So I decided I'd leave Ellingus and move into that area. Uh, UCD well, it wasn't ready to take me on at that time, but I got a position in Trinity and I did an analysis there of the inputs into Irish industry. And that meant I had to contact 250 firms and visit 50 of them. My calculation was that when then, a year or two of time, within, when the mass came to power rather than different era, the economy began to open up, that the industrialists would know about me as an industrial economist. All other economists talked only about agriculture. The debate on the critical report in the Statistical Society, five people talked about agriculture, only Donald and Nevin talked about industry. So I, I placed myself there, and as a result, when Lamas told the Federation of Irish Industries to start, do some preliminary work, look at how an industry would survive in free trade, it was I and another UCD economist were asked to do the job. And then when we completed that task, so for the wool and worsted industry, I put into the report that uh, it took us a year, the 23 industries at the time, we'd never get ready in time unless industry and government worked together. And I proposed the two would get together. and. Uh, I contacted Ken Whitaker, Secretary of Finance, and that was done. So in July of 61, the Committee on Industrial Organization was established at my suggestion, and from then the whole of Irish industry was reviewed, and that led into the second program of expansion, the economic planning. So for the 60s, I was working, amongst other things, for the Federation of Industries as their consultant. And uh, uh, that was uh, getting a lot of very relevant experience for politics. And uh, did you realize at that point did you expect that Ireland would inevitably join the oh, European yes. Union? That's yeah. why I left Ellingus. It's not expectation. I planned it carefully. And politics. You have written in your autobiography that you were uncertain which political party to join. <sighs> well, yes. Um, Fianna Fáil asked me to join them. Charlie Harhey wrote me in 61, and I said no. Did he actually ask you to join? I have a letter somewhere from him. Actually, yes. I, I thought it was verbal, but I... To draw you into the maw of the party is how you put it in your memoirs. Yes. Yes, I see, yes. Yeah. And, but no, I, I felt that Le Mans was the man we needed to start economic growth. And I voted Fianna Fáil in the 61 election. I voted for Sean McEntee rather than John A. Costello in his constituency. Because I thought Le Mans would be better for us for that stage, at that stage uh, than uh, Dylan. But I didn't think Le Mans, I didn't think Fianna Fáil people like Hawhey coming forward, would really have the concern for the social development of the country and that they were great for economic growth at that stage, but not for what you'd do with the growth when you got it. So it was a question of labour in Fine Gael. And between the two, in Fine Gael I would have more influence, Fine Gael background, uh, but also uh, the party would be more easily shifted. Labour would tie down by trade unions, in that respect conservative, um, be more difficult to, uh, to shift. And if I could move Fine Gael into a more progressive position over time, then with Labour, a government could be formed. That was my... So I, I, I joined Fine Gael for those very practical reasons, as well as partly sentimental ones. It would have been difficult not to, but uh, it seemed to me that it was the... You the, had baggage, and it was going to look better in Fine Gael, wasn't it? It was going to be more useful yeah, in Yeah, and Gael. I thought the party was open to shift its position, whereas Labour would not be so easy to shift. James Dillon was leader when you joined. Yes. Um, but he didn't stay for very long. No, no, on the contrary. I, I stood for the Senate. I was to be candidate in the Doyle, but I, I chickened out on that in why? 65. I never quite knew why. Joan was against it, and I was uncertain myself. At the last moment, I said I wouldn't stand. I had to find somebody else a candidate here. And uh, then after the election, Declan Costello and Alexis Fitzgerald, 
uh, John A. Custer's son in law, a great close friend of mine, they suggested I stand for the Senate. And I did. I went around the country and uh, I got sufficient votes to be elected. I wasn't as very popular because my election displaced the party's main fundraiser, Ned McGuire Brown Thomas. And uh, it was the end of the campaign. I actually stopped looking for votes, hoping it wouldn't put them out. And the very few people standing in the Senate who did not complete the process. Um, and I got 64 votes, he got 40, and uh, I got the, the seat. Now, you must have been disappointed that Liam Cosgrave was the man to succeed James Dillon because you wanted to change the party. Well, no, because I, I, Liam Cosgrave was seen at the time as being a, a reformer in the party. Um, but as against Were you not that, hoping that Declan Costello? Yes, I mean, I would have hoped for Declan Costello being the leader, but uh, there wasn't seen to be such a difference between them at the time. But uh, that all happened when I was out canvassing. So it was, it was a quick change once Dylan resigned? A very quick change indeed, yes. Done immediately. And yourself and Declan Costello were close then. What, what were your intentions for the party if you could change it? Well, we'd, we'd known each other since we met in school debates in, in university. And uh, Declan uh, had the previous year uh, put to the party need to change in a, towards a more social democratic approach. Um, he, in fact, was threatening to leave the party. I think his father said to him, look, you can't leave without telling them what you want them to do. They say no, fair enough. Uh, but they said yes. And I actually went to see him at lunch with him, and he told me this was happening. He said, hold off, and I'll see what happens. And then the party did accept his proposals, and we then got down to write up all these policies during the following year before the Senate election came, the Doyle election. And when you told Ken Whitaker, um, the senior civil servant in finance and a mentor by now, wasn't he? That you were going into politics and I, that was your intention. He, you shocked, markedly hostile, you say, was well, his I, response. Well, I wrote him. I thought I ought to tell him this was happening. And he wrote back, uh, rang me up, I'd forgotten one way or the other, and said, it was a great mistake. You'd lose all your influence if you went to politics. I've often teased him about that afterwards. He thought you could be more influential from the outside. Yes, because my economic commentary in the Irish Times and was, you know, was at that stage quite influential, I think, and, and uh, he thought, well, that would be lost. And he didn't see the possibility of doing much in politics. And what did you see as the possibility at that moment? Well, I, I hope within the party to influence it so that it would become, as Declan Costa was, more social democratic. And later on, I also wanted to be more, more liberal in some ways. Um, and that if we could shift the party in that direction, there could be change in Ireland. Because politics is about change. The only point of going to politics is to change things. If you don't want to change things, why bother? If you want to change things, then um, y you need your party to shift direction. You don't join a party because you agree with it. It's a rather static view. It seems to me you join it because through the party you can influence change. And were you optimistic that change was possible then? Yes, I was. With Declan Castle, there were other people who supported his views. And it's clear there was, a, there was a wind of change in the party, although the other people were more conservative. And that had to be you know, argued out in due course. And it was argued out. And was Lamas not a very formidable figure at that, at that moment, uh, for you to be optimistic that Fine Gael would be, would be making the changes? Well, yes, but Lamas was then in his mid-60s. I don't expect him to retire just as soon as he did, but he wasn't going to be there indefinitely. A new generation were moving in in Fianna Fáil, and there were aspects of that that worried me. Whereas I thought in Fine Gael, knowing some of the younger people there, that we could shift the party and move towards government perhaps the next election, 69. But then Labour said uh, the 70s would be socialist and rejected coalition then. So that was a disappointment in 69. But then in 73 it happened. And have you ever regretted the decision to go into politics? No, never. Um, it was the right thing to do. I was perhaps unfortunate and disappointed to find myself in government. There was no money to do anything. And all we could do was cut spending and raise taxes instead of doing the positive things I wanted to do. Any other time might have been better. Having said that, no, I, n I never regretted it. And I was very happy indeed to find myself in foreign affairs in 73. And looking back, uh, how would you measure your impact on politics here? Well, I think I, I did help the, the process of Fine Gael and Labour coming closer together. And we were in government then in the 70s and again in the 80s. Uh, my concern about Northern Ireland, which I always had, at a very deep level, I chanced to something about that. On Europe, I wanted us to be moved towards more political integration in Europe because I thought that would suit a small country like us, wouldn't be bossed and exploited by larger countries, um, and that our whole country should 
be more pluralist and open. I was able to contribute to each of these things in different ways over time. Your constitutional crusade, for instance, do you consider that a success? In the longer run, yes, but uh, when I came back into government after a brief interval of nine months, everything had changed. The IRA threat in Northern Ireland, support for it was growing so rapidly, I had to change tactics and concentrate on trying to change British policy in Northern Ireland uh, rather than concentrate on changing things here. So the changes in this state becoming more pluralist and uh, open uh, and, um, and our nationalism becoming one that would in, it could accommodate unionists as well. All that came later. So it turned out to be premature at the time. But I think that nonetheless, the fact that I launched it then uh, did help later on to move it along. Embracing the liberal agenda, in other words, put that on the map. And even if you lost referenda, it was part of the grammar of our politics and eventually inevitably came. Is that your argument? Yeah, we, yes. Um, the abortion thing was complicated and I didn't handle it well, but whatever I did, it didn't matter because once uh, Charles Hawley well, backed it, he was going to go through with a quarter of the Labour Party and eight Fine Gael people in favour. But the government, we were government and opposition was going to go through, but uh, that, that was messy. Uh, we had the divorce referendum, contraception were able to effectively clear. And the Bush referendum we didn't succeed with, but we cleared the way for another referendum in, in uh, 10 years' time. And I thought that we needed to do something about divorce because in the absence of divorce, so many second unions were being created and children growing up with no recognition by church or state that we were destabilizing marriage. And I saw a restricted form of divorce, a modest, modest form of divorce, as the best way to, to safeguard marriage in our society. That, that view was not widely held. That debate was carried on between people who said you have a civic right to divorce, which I can never understand, how you can have a, a right to uh, repudiate an indissoluble arrangement, and, and the other side saying that it would open the floodgates and everybody get divorced, which is equally absurd. I couldn't get people to focus on the, what seems to be the real issue. What's the best thing to do for marriage? Looking back on your life now, do you have any major regrets? Well, I have regrets about people whose careers, one way or the other, I may have damaged even if uh, I may still think it was necessary to do what I did, but I could have done things better. So my regrets would be about people, a small, small number of people who... Names? So, no. Do you regret uh, uh, the relationship that you had with Charles Hohey and the flawed pedigree when he was being nominated for Taoiseach? Well, the wording was, of course, completely misunderstood. Uh, it related to the fact that he differed from all previous Taoiseach in not having the support of a large part of his own party. In that respect, it was flawed. But the choice of words was misunderstood. Nobody actually noticed what the context or what the sentence it was in. And that was it. But I don't regret it. The words were also poorly chosen. They were poor. Yeah. yeah, the words were poorly chosen because I, I had ended up writing that speech at 4.30 4 in the morning. And uh, that was a mistake. But uh, the opposition uh, to his becoming prime minister, Tisha, no, I don't regret that. I thought that there would be problems with him as a teacher. You met him recently? Yes. Why? Well, we've known each other for, what, 63 years now. He's been very ill, and I thought I should go and see him. And uh, we chatted over old times in college and that, himself and, and Maureen. We knew each other very well at the time. One occasion, we went together to a parliamentary press gallery dinner. At least I went with Joan, he was there too. Maureen wasn't with him, and the seeking put uh, husband and wife together, so it was Joan, it was me, Joan, Charlie. So she looked at the seating and said, Charlie, I'm stuck between you and Garrett. I have no intention to go to Garrett all night. You'll have to use some of your celebrated charm on me. So they spent the evening talking about who married whom out of college and who divorced whom. Was that meeting at his invitation or no, your no, prompt? No, 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 your I, suggestion? I, did. I didn't know whether he wanted to, but he, he did, yes. And, uh, I was very glad I went and did a very uh, nice chat about the past. I never I have to say, we never had any um, difficulty at personal relationship. We have always found him cur courteous, always had a good private relationship with him. I, I still feel that he was not the right person to be Prime Minister, but that's a political point. Uh, but it never affected our ordinary courteous personal relationship, which was always straightforward. And what's your view of Irish society today? Well, <laughs> if we got rich a bit slower and a bit sooner, it might have been better because becoming so rich so quickly is a bit destabilizing in society. And inevitably, when that happens, the rich get richer faster, the poor get better off. 
and the division between incomes increases and people become more individualistic, more materialistic. So there are some social consequences of the rapid growth uh, of the economy which are negative, but on the other hand, it is very important that all our young people know they can live in Ireland, have a job here. They may go away for a year or two, and many of them do, get experience and come back. But the old system in which people had to emigrate was absolutely intolerable. I've never been able to accept or cope with the idea of somebody having to leave their own country and live elsewhere. I've always had huge emotional difficulty with that. So to have changed that uh, has been wonderful. And Gareth Fitzgerald, the big picture, how would you assess your impact on Irish politics? Well, I'm the worst person to do that. Other people have to do that. But basically, uh, on Northern Ireland, Europe, and on making our country more open, more pluralist, uh, and uh, opening it to the possibility of North and South coming together in a positive way, they're the things that interested me most. But I was, also, uh, I was also happy to be able to do something in government in terms of social policy. You celebrated your 80th birthday. You're still working. You're still writing. Yes. What else should I do? <laughs> if you can write and talk, uh, well then, and you, and you can then contribute something once you go on doing so. And uh, I'm basically, I'm didactic. I like to teach, whether by writing or by, uh, or by speaking. And, uh, uh, there's always things that interest me, things I want to look into and tell people about. And it's great to have the opportunity to do that. Is that the key, Gareth, that you're a teacher? Yes. Uh, intellectual curiosity, which has led me down all kinds of stray directions during my life, uh, and the desire to communicate to people and to inform them and to change things. And do you think about the next world? Not much. Do you fear, do you fear death? No. Yeah. You're content to keep going? Yes, you keep going until you stop, yes. <laughs> Gareth Fitzgerald, thank you very much. <laughs>like to join John Bowman and guests as part of the audience of questions and answers on Monday nights please ring 01 208 2941 wasn't there an obligation uh, on us as a country to say this is barbarism and we're not tolerating no there isn't an obligation to a country to constantly protest about things that is not foreign policy that's just stupidity continues next Sunday at 10:20 on RT1